very good afternoon uh, respected chairpersons and dear delegates uh, today i would like to speak in favor of treatment of a condition known as asymptomatic hyperuricemia so uh, my motion is it should be treated so this is a brief history about the journey of uric acid the this panel is very commonly known as the doyen of hyperuricemia and gout compared on the contrary this panel is comprising of frederick a mohammed this physician is less known because he was the first person who told that hyperuricemia may be linked to hypertension and this raised many eyebrows around the world and opened a new real avenue for cardiovascular risk and hyperuricemia the problem of hyperuricemia is that there is no universally acceptable definition there is no global consensus in defining hyperuricemia right from the beginning the causes are plenty i'm not going into details of any of the causes well if we take a look at the epidemiological data uh, in the enhanced 3 and enhanced 2007 and 2008 we can see in the us there is a marked rise in the prevalence of hyperuricemia in us the causes were attributed to obesity alcohol lifestyle changes and many other causes on the contrary a cross sectional study of health insurance claims database from japan Uh, showed that only 2.6% of the asymptomatic hyperuricemia prevalence among 2.95 lakh population the the, the uh, answer was given by the japanese physicians who preferred to treat asymptomatic hyperuricemia compared to the us physicians so there is a clear cut discrepancy between japan and us in treating the same the indian data followed which has shown the hyperuricemia has been an increasing prevalence especially among the obese the diabetics and hypertensives now the famous oxidant antioxidant paradox of uric acid some experimental studies claim that uric acid is an antioxidant because of its uh, nature of uh, preventing lipid peroxidation but it is heavily limited to the uh, this property because it is only in presence of ascorbic acid and thiols and only extracellular urate is capable of doing that several experimental studies and animal models have proved that uric acid is rather a pro oxidant because of its superoxide dependent mechanism of increasing oxidative stress leading to endothelial dysfunction and a pro inflammatory state this is the proposed model for urate induced oxidative stress via ros now we are speaking about this uh, stage this is asymptomatic hyperuricemia because uh, it can be divided into two stages first one is uh, stage where there is no crystal deposition and the patient remains asymptomatic and the second one is the stage where there is crystal deposition without any symptoms so we are worried about the potential clinical consequences regarding the non crystal deposition disorders of soluble uric acid which may lead to cardiovascular complications ckd metabolic syndrome and cerebrovascular disease so you can see when you talk about hyperuricemia we are very much aware of this bomb which is about to explode or has exploded that is gout what about a bomb which has a timer on it and has yet not exploded and you are not even aware of it the pathophysiology of gout does not really come to the ambit of my talk today but majority of the uh, patients suffering from gout are under excretors rather than over producers of uric acid So the first study was a normative aging study which proved the incidence of gout was directly linked to the uh, degree of asymptomatic hyperuricemia but we all know that all patients with asymptomatic hyperuricemia do not develop gout the answer to this disparity was given by Degan et al they developed a risk score on the basis of association of three genetic loci and the concentration of risk of gout but if we cannot predict the first occurrence of gout is it beneficial to treat uh, to prevent the first occurrence of gout unfortunately yet now we do not have that robust evidence to prove there has been a definite association between hyperuricemia and nephrolithiasis and urate lowering therapy has been shown to be beneficial in lowering the risk of nephrolithiasis in patients this is the most uncontested and undebated indication of treating asymptomatic hyperuricemia that is patients receiving chemotherapy for leukemia and lymphoma allopurinol has been a revolutionary drug for this and many studies have proved the efficacy of allopurinol in preventing this acute urate nephropathy now the concern of the hour cardiovascular disease and hyperuricemia the guidelines and evidence both are in opposite poles the opinions and facts are running haywire and there's a lots of controversies on that 
What is the link between hyperuricemia and hypertension? This is a proposed two-stage model of blood pressure uh, increased by hyperuricemia due to suppression of nitric acid, proliferation of vascular smooth muscle cells, platelet adhesiveness, and many other causes of endothelial dysfunction. So as far as evidence is concerned, these studies have showed the effect of allopurinol on blood pressure, especially in lowering the systolic blood pressure, which was around minus 6.3 in the patients who received allopurinol. And hyperuricemia has been established as an independent uh, traditional risk factor for incident hypertension as well. Now there was a very big controversy regarding whether hyperuricemia is the cause of hypertension or it is the reverse. But this was answered by the Boga Lusa Heart Study where they have shown that childhood uric acid was a novel predictor of increased blood pressure in adults. Now the risk of atherosclerosis was also increased in hyperuricemia in many studies where they have shown an association between hyperuricemia and increased carotid intima media thickness as well as the increased risk of coronary artery calcium score. Now this was the meta-analysis which was legendary in its own because it compiled across 28 studies and 4 lakh population where they have shown that association of hyperuricemia with coronary heart disease was around 9% and on the contrary association of hyperuricemia was also associated with a 16% increase in overall mortality. The ENHANCE study was one of the largest study linking serum uric acid to mortality and cardiovascular mortality which has proved that increased serum uric acid levels were independently and significantly associated with the risk of cardiovascular mortality and there was substantial benefit in treating these patients. Now, hyperuricemia and heart failure is a very debatable topic. Uh, this study, hyperuricemia and incident and heart failure, showed that hyperuricemia was a novel independent risk factor for heart failure in a group of young general community dwellers. And not only a risk factor, as it was also proved to be a poor prognostic marker. We are all aware of the exact heart failure study where allopurinol was used to improve cardiovascular mortality, but unfortunately the results did not favor allopurinol. But apart from exact heart failure, which had its own limitations, there are many studies which has been done on improvement uh, of myocardial contractility, ejection fraction on uh, xanthine oxidase inhibition. The very famous LIVE study which was conducted to prove the cardiovascular benefit of losartan over atinolol uh, was uh, attributed to the uricosuric action of losartan in itself. The very much neglected peripheral arterial disease was also found to be associated in Taiwanese and Chinese population with increasing risk of hyperuricemia. Now coming to hyperuricemia and renal disease, the main mechanism was attributed to glomerular alteration of glomerular hemodynamics and activation of the renin angiotensin system. A very large study was conducted, a 25-year follow-up for risk factors for end-stage renal disease has proved that hyperuricemia is a novel risk factor for developing end-stage renal disease. Now these are multiple RCTs on urate lowering therapy in CKD which has shown that uh, this uh, drug allopurinol mainly has slowed the progression of CKD and decreased proteinuria. Two of studies are from India as well. <coughs> Coming to acute kidney injury, hyperuricemia did not disappoint here as well. Now the very controversial metabolic syndrome, there was also again a controversy whether hyperinsulinemia is causing hyperuricemia by preventing renal excretion of uric acid. This was answered by the Finnish diabetes prevention study which has shown that hyperuricemia has been an independent risk factor for progression to hyperinsulinemia which has been seen in an 11 year follow up. The lipid profile alteration has also been seen in association with hyperuricemia and now the very novel concept of dietary fructose intake and increasing risk of hyperuricemia and both of these factors act as independent markers of uh, increased risk for non-alcoholic fatty liver disease and NASH. Coming to stroke, hyperuricemia may moderately, modestly increase the risks of both stroke incidence and mortality that has been proved in many studies and meta-analysis as well. So, if we try to follow the guidelines, you can see only the Japanese guidelines is differing from all other guidelines, ACR, EULAR, American Rheumatology Association, ACP, and literally they have outweighed the Japanese guidelines. So, what do the Japanese say? They say that if, if serum urate is greater than 9, you go for treatment uh, straight away without any uh, hesitance. But if it's greater than 8 with other cardiovascular renal risk factors, you should advocate treatment. In Japan, 84 to 89% of nephrologists prefer treating asymptomatic hyperuricemia and chronic kidney disease compared to only 4% of the US nephrologists. So right now the, the thing is very chaotic. 
there is no global consensus and hyperuricemia tends to be omnipresent everywhere. So this is the preferred guidelines for management. Only one definite indication is there, that is to prevent acute urate nephropathy in chemotherapy. Apart from that, with patients having history of kidney stones and very high levels of uric acid are being stressed upon, uh, they have mainly stressed upon lifestyle modification first, rather giving urate lowering therapy after adequate investigations. But the science has revealed that purine-free diet is completely a myth because majority of hyperuricemia is contributed by endogenous purine than exogenous purine. But rules are meant to be broken. This very art, the article published in Saudi Journal of Medical Sciences showed that doctors in Makkah region depend on the level of uric acid rather than the international guidelines on treating. And an AJKD arterial, uh, art, uh, editorial has revealed and uh, proved a valid questionnaire that when the uric acid is exceeding uh, 9 milligram per deciliter, the risk is almost three times for CKD. So when shall we start treatment? So to summarize, asymptomatic hyperuricemia doesn't deserve to be ignored at this point of time. Uh, when serum uric acid is greater than 9, there is increased risk of CVD as well as cardio, uh, CKD, chronic kidney disease. We do not have an adequate risk score, like the ACVD risk score or FRAX risk score when to initiate treatment. Lifestyle modica modification is the key till date, and therapy is not recommended till now except the Japanese guidelines. So uh, moreover, with this statistical jugglery and a lot of meta-analysis, evidences, observational study I spoke about, we are standing at a point where we are not treating this condition. So I don't know whether in near future or in the long run, this masterly inactivity may harm us at all. Thank you very much for your patient hearing.